Thanks for joining us today for Cape Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClellan. On today's show, we'll talk with retiring Southeast Missouri State University President Ken Dobbins. Dobbins has served as the university's president since 1999. During his time at the helm, the university opened the River Campus. Enrollment has steadily grown each year. New regional campuses opened and online classes blossomed. As the, and the university completed many, many construction and renovation projects to improve facilities. Dobbins will retire from Southeast this summer. A talk with Southeast Missouri State University's 17th president. That's ahead on Cape Chronicle. This is your next step. You don't want to miss this. Sign up for First Step today. It's Cape Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClellan. Southeast Missouri State University President Ken Dobbins is retiring after 16 years of leadership. He'll leave a legacy of enrollment growth, new academic programs, and a campus with new facilities and renovated buildings. Ken Dobbins, thank you so much for joining us. Jacob, thank you very much for having me on your, your program. Well, the, the list of accomplishments um, during your tenure as, as president is, is quite long. Um, but I'd like to start with, with that enrollment growth, which is been growing um, for the last 20 years. And it's not like Southeast has had uh, this big spike in enrollment. It's been this, this, steady, this steady climb. What's kind, of the, what's kind of the secret recipe? What's the secret sauce for a university to, to, to maintain this type, of, uh, this type of growth? Well, I don't know if there's a, a special sauce, uh, but I, I have to say that in 1994, when we had 7,900 students, we knew that we needed to grow uh, for a number of reasons. One, because um, we want to serve our region, and, and the other is because of uh, financial, obviously, um, but we didn't want to grow too much so that uh, we would have s such large growing pains. Uh, so we looked strategically on where can we grow and how can we do that. <clears throat> and, and part of it was the way we ran residence halls. Part of it was that we needed to have a diversity like the state of Missouri. That was one of our goals, as you know, um, the, the diversity of the, the population of the state. So that meant going from some 300 African-American students now to over 1,000. Um, our international program was under 200 at a time, and now it's over 1,000. Um, those, are, those are things that we strategically looked at how are we going to do it, and the one thing that we wanted to make sure was that it wasn't a revolving door that the students graduated. And I think that we've succeeded with that because obviously you can't continue uh, to grow if you lose through, re through attrition. Uh, so we looked at obviously retention issues. Uh, so it, it's a combination. Um, the other piece is uh, our, online, our online programs have really blossomed. We now have over a thousand students that are completely online. Um, so when you look at that, um, that's very important to, to have programs that we can give to our uh, constituencies that they wouldn't be able to come to Southeast. Um, we have people that have gone to Iraq and Afghanistan and take, taken courses while they're there. Uh, so I think that that's really very, very important to have a well-balanced approach to enrollment growth and that's why 20 years, 14 years, the, the record breaking. Uh, and, and the other one that, that I forgot about and I shouldn't forget about it when we talk about Afghanistan is our military. Uh, we've increased significantly how we can uh, be more friendly to the military. We already have been designated as a friendly military university. Uh, so it's a combination. Uh, the, you mentioned the regional campuses. I, I guess I could go on and on. <laughs> I think you got the picture that it is not just one thing. It's a number of things uh, for us to sustain it. And behind all of that are quality academic programs. If you don't have quality academic programs, I don't care what university you are, it's not going to work. Well, let's talk a little bit about those, those regional campuses and just 
what, how important are those to having access to higher education for folks, not just here in Cape Girardeau, but throughout the, the southeast Missouri region? Well, as you know, um, uh, Governor Carnahan provided some, uh, uh, the, it was called Mission Enhancement Money, and originally uh, we thought that two things we were going to do with it, establish a school of polytechnic studies and also develop two regional campuses south under the same kind of model that we had in Malden, which we've had for 25 years. Um, it is really important in Sykeston, in Malden, and in Kennett uh, for us to have a presence because there are place-bound students that would not go to college. And it's very interesting. I'm a first-generation college graduate. There are a lot of folks that um, maybe they dropped out of school, maybe they didn't go to school, maybe they dropped out to have a family, to work, whatever. Um, and now in, in Kennett and Malden and Sykeston, they can go to, go to school. And what's going to happen is, and it'll, you, it'll take a decade to watch it, but what's going to happen is that, well, my mom, my dad, are, they're going to college. They will then think, I can go to college, and I'm going to. So that's really important to us. We have 1,400 students south of here. That's really very, very important. Place-bound students and, and those who have never had a chance if it wasn't for us. You, you had mentioned earlier that Southeast um, has more minority students now than they did uh, a decade or two decades ago. How did, how did the university, how did the university um, approach this to go, to, to go bring in more minority students to, the, to campus? Well, I think it's important to understand that we wanted to have that diversity, but we wanted to make sure that they're successful. To have the diversity and then they don't, they don't graduate is not what we want to do. Um, so we looked at how can we make them successful, just like other students. How can we make them successful? Maybe it's additional tutoring. Um, also, um, Trent Ball and his folks have worked very hard at going to outside agencies and saying, give them, get, let's give them a scholarship and we'll match it. Um, you know, we, we have uh, excellent partners in St. Louis. Uh, that we get uh, a large majority of the scholarships to come to Southeast. That's very, very important to us and it's very important to them uh, because a lot of those students, not all, but a lot of them some, uh, uh, have high need. Uh, and we want to help them so they don't have to worry as much about uh, working two or three jobs so that they can make ends meet. That's why it's important that our foundation has done a really good job of getting endowed scholarships uh, raised for our students. You know, in a matter of, I think it was six months, um, we, had a, we had a matching program and we received uh, $1.9 million in endowed scholarships. Now, you know, that's a, that's a lot of money, but when you match it with the rest of our foundation endowments, <clears throat> we give about $1.7 million every year in scholarships to our, our students everywhere in Southeast. So it could be a regional campus, it could be on campus here. Uh, so that's so important to provide access is to provide opportunities financially for, for everyone. Why was it so important to, uh, to, to specifically go out and look for more international students, which is, which is, which is, which is, really, which is really grown here on campus yeah. in the last, uh, in the last uh, few years? Well, you know, um, uh, Friedman wrote, the, the world is flat if you remember, mm -hmm. uh, and in that, th the internet made the change that now it is flat. Well, our students obviously are, are uh, competing against uh, students over in um, Kentucky and Tennessee, but really they're competing against those students uh, overseas in India and in China and in Brazil. So if we're in a world economy, um, how are we going to make sure that our students are prepared to be in an internationally world economy and in the job market? Well, a lot of our students don't have the opportunity to go overseas, so why not bring the overseas to us? And, and we see that that is a very important part of why Southeast is so strong in that our students have experiences with international students and with people that they're going to work with for the rest of their lives. So that's why it's so important. And it's so important not to just get one country or two countries. Um, I can't remember the number and I'm, I should, but I think we have over 45 countries that uh, we have students from. And that's, that, that's really kind of neat. Uh, ch changing topics a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the renovations at, uh, at Academic Hall. 
there's a lot of history in, in, in this building. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that you learned about the university when, uh, when construction and renovation was, was, was going on there in that building? Well, there were a lot of wonderful things that, that we experienced uh, with this renovation. Um, there are a couple that are kind of, one's kind of funny and one's kind of telling you the quality of workmanship for individuals that were here to build that building. Um, the first one was, um, as you know, I, I used to kid that, that we needed to to uh, renovate Academic Hall because the pipes were the, the, the black iron pipes and they were breaking all the time. And there used to be a swimming pool in the basement. And my concern was that one of these days we'd come back from a long weekend and the swimming pool will, would have reappeared. And, you know, and everyone laughs about it, but just think about all that water coming down and breaking. Because we, we had that problem. Um, that we said we have to do something when uh, in a, over a cashier's um, area she was processing millions of dollars of transactions for payment. Fortunately she wasn't there when a pipe broke and it went and it took him a week to dry all the money and the, the checks out. Um, so that was so funny about it is that that swimming pool when they, when they tore up the floor the, the surrounding area was still there. So part of the swimming pool was still there so that's kind of interesting. I, I guess the, the other um, interesting part about academic is that it truly is a, a beautiful piece of art, quite frankly. When you go up into the dome area, and that is one that um, only very few people could go up to because it was so dangerous. Uh, we had the discussion with the board saying, you know, we have a certain place if we're, if we're under budget, then maybe we can go ahead and put uh, a mezzanine there and we can have people uh, able to go up and have lunch or have a meeting uh, and then go up and actually look through the portholes. That's something that's really uh, was really wonderful. Uh, and then the final thing that I think was very important was that Academic Hall uh, is our icon. And we got away from uh, having students on a regular basis you know, periodic class or two, but on a regular basis of being in academic hall. And you listen to some of our alums and they talk about, well, I met my wife, I met my husband in academic hall in a class. So I wanted to make sure that the students could take a speech course, and almost all students take a speech course, they have one, cor one class in academic hall. And I think that's going to be a tradition that people will look back and say, boy, I'm glad. I'm glad that it was renovated, and I'm really glad that I had a class in Academic Hall. Some, some couples might have uh, met there in, in Academic Hall <laughs> and then went up into the dome and signed their names on the, uh, on the interior. Well, if they did, most of the time they snuck up there. So. <laughs> <laughs> so for folks that haven't seen the new Academic Hall yet, who haven't been in there, what's a, what's a good reason for folks to stop by, so maybe some... Some, excuse me, some graduates, folks that haven't been back in a while. What's a, what, give them a good reason to come back and, and, and check out what it looks like Well, now. if they come at 2 o'clock every day, we have tours. If, they, if people come into our office, we'll take them up and they can sign their name. I think that, that's exciting. Uh, you know, um, uh, Anderson Cooper signed his name up there. Uh, uh, he, he didn't want to at first. He, he went up there but didn't want to sign. So I said, you know, we really like for you to sign. And he did. And it's there. It's right as you come through the door. You look, turn around and look, and then right there it is. So let's talk a little bit about the about the, about the about the river campus. Um, what's that added to uh, to the community here in, in Cape Girardeau and to southeast Missouri? Well, you know, I I talked about um, enrollment and how you get enrollment and increases in enrollment, and I said you have to have strong academic programs. This is a great example of a strong academic program. When we went into the river campus, we had 200 and some, maybe 220 majors. Now we have over 500. But let me, let me tell you what's so beautiful about the River Campus in that um, um, it is one of the few places that you can go in the United States <clears throat> that you have a school for art, theater, music, dance, and such premier facilities, not only for practice, but for performance. Um, and and um, we started in 98, 1998. <clears throat> Excuse me one second, okay? <clears throat> and um, we had some preliminary dollars for planning, looked really good, great vision by the president of the board and, and Dale Nitsky and, and I and some, several others. 
And then all of a sudden, 9-11 uh, occurred. So we had a recession. Um, and then it started to come up, and we had, we had issues on raising money. Um, it was, my wife calls it, it took nine years. My wife calls it my nine-year pregnancy. Uh, <laughs> and it, quite frankly, there are so many difficulties at times, you, you didn't know whether or not it was going to actually occur. Um, and there are a lot of major donors, and 25% came from major donors and, and, regu uh, and other donors uh, for, to our foundation, um, nine million came from the city. Uh, we had our congressional earmarks uh, because of some issues of money. Uh, and then we had the state come in for about 50%. Uh, so when you think about that, what a great partnership. It's a wonderful example of a partnership. And my wife and I, Janine and I, will go and, and for example, the Wizard of Oz was here. Uh, and uh, several years ago, and it was, it's the Broadway Wizard of Oz. It was a great performance. But what was interesting, I like to look at the crowd, and I saw these little girls with their red slippers and their beautiful white dresses, and, you know, they're looking and saying, oh, my gosh. Now, I have to tell you that they probably would never be able to see that production ever in their, in their youth because they may not have the opportunity to go to the Fox in St. Louis or go to Memphis. So we have opened up not only a great place for students to learn and perform, um, but also we've opened up a cultural issue, a cultural uh, area here that we supply a lot of uh, cultural events for, you know, what, half a million people? Um, so it, it really means a lot <clears throat> to CAPE. It means a lot to our region. But it, really, it means a lot to our students. I know. I, I think my daughter has, has has some great memories of seeing productions and, and concerts at the at, at, at the River Campus yes. as well. Yes. Um, let's let's talk a little <clears throat> bit about the about the science facilities that have been that have been renovated uh, here at Southeast. What were what were these facilities like before the renovations, and what do they what do they look like What do they look like now? What's available What's available now for for science students? Think about going to your high school and being in a, in a chemistry lab or a biology lab in 1979. That's what our labs looked like in 2012. Um, and, and I have to say that our faculty um, really sold our science program, not our facilities. Because um, our pre-med program, our pre-vet program, our uh, biology, chemistry, physics, uh, all those programs in the sciences are really strong. Um, and um, the facilities were horrid. As you know, both academic and uh, McGill, uh, the labs, uh, the whole transformation of, of the McGill was, was done with bonds, not from the state. We haven't received much from the state since the River Campus, but from students wanting, wanting this, our regents having the vision to do this, and us finding ways, and of course the bond market was really good to us too. Um, so uh, those two projects and the, the, um, um, the changing from, from coal to gas in, in our uh, uh, power plant, is all funded by bonds that students, student fees will pay off. Um, so I think that what it has done, it's transformed our science program uh, into a very, to, from a good program to a very good program. And you have to have the labs in order to be able to do that in state of the art. This is going to be wonderful for our students and our faculty because our faculty can do research, our students can have quality programs. I, I have to tell you, most of the high schools had better labs than we had uh, until we did our renovations. So we're really pleased. Now, um, Southeast has a partnership with the, uh, with the Center for Strategic and, and International Studies. Yeah. What kind of opportunities um, does this open up for students? Well, you know, it gives us an opportunity to take 30 students every spring break. And we're the only institution, higher education institution, that brings 30 students at spring break, four or five faculty. Um, and they get to talk to experts in many areas, in global issues, quite frankly. Um, Tony Kordsman came and spoke not too long ago here on campus, and he is the expert in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, if he, he's been a, a diplomat, he's been in uh, defense intelligence, he's worked for the Secretary of Defense. When people want to talk about those, those two countries, they go to him. 
So we have a relationship. Um, James Lewis, um, uh, we have him coming in uh, to talk to our students, and he wrote the strategic plan for cybersecurity. He came to on campus when we rolled that out. Thought it was a great, a great idea for us. So what happens is that those students get to talk with the experts in many areas and global issues, and then they have a they, they have a kind of a exercise that they have to do go through, and it changes every year. And one year it was when President Obama was coming into office. You are the Secretary of Defense. You are the Secretary of Health and Welfare. What do you how what do you brief the president on, and why? So it gives them a lot of opportunity. The other thing it does is half the students um, have never been to Washington, D.C., which is a, an experience in itself because of all the history and what's there. And three or four of the 30 have never flown on an airplane. So it really is a life change. I, I go and talk to them every year before they have, because they have to prepare and we have great faculty uh, working with them. I said, if it is not a life-changing event, for you, I'll refund your money. I've not refunded my money in nine <laughs> years, so I'm not expecting to this last year either. Well, you, you were talking about cybersecurity, um, and that's one of the newer programs at, at Southeast Missouri State. Why was, why was cybersecurity chosen as a, as, a, as a program to develop and to, and to nurture here? Um, well, quite honestly, I thought it was one that needed to be done. So I kind of pushed on this. Um, we found a slot for a faculty member. It took us two years to find an outstanding faculty member that we now have. And it's an up-and-coming um, area. Uh, we now have 100, over 120 majors, and our seniors have at least two job offers in their senior year. Uh, we can't produce enough graduates to fulfill the needs out there in cybersecurity. <clears throat> now, that being said, let me tell you one other thing that I thought we needed to do. Um, I pushed on that. I pushed on construction management, facilities management, based on relationships that I have with people in, in the state government and other places. The institution needed uh, a, a mechanism uh, that would identify the next cybersecurity. What is that next major we need? So I established an academic visioning committee. Um, and they, we, we asked for ideas from faculty, from employers, from admissions, you know, admissions folks are saying, no, we don't have that major, and they get tired of saying we don't have that major. Uh, so we now have that as part of the fabric of Southeast Missouri State University. Health sciences is one that they have said, this is, this is one we want to do. And, and why do we want to do that? Well, we have 700 pre-nursing majors, and we only take 100 a year. We have a lot of people that go into pre-med, and they're not going to make it to be a medical doctor, but they love medicine. So there are other things that they can do, and that, that's, a, that's an example of, of what we can do to make sure that students can be successful. Maybe not in their original field that they think they want to be in. I don't know about you, but I changed my major, thank heavens, from engineering <laughs> to accounting. So I, you know, I, I know that it happens. Uh, so anyhow, that's why cybersecurity and, and is really a very important. It, it, was a, it was kind of an unheard of back then, but it's now a hot, hot, hot topic. Is, is Southeast still one of the only Midwestern schools that offers a, a cybersecurity program? Well, there's some of them that are trying to copy that. Um, but I have to tell you that we have a, co a competition, our student competition. And um, uh, it was like two or three weeks ago. And we, there were, uh, I think, six states. And um, we won the six states. So we're going to districts and we're looking forward to it. Let's talk a little bit about, about agriculture. Agriculture is obviously a big driver of the local economy in southeast Missouri, and we have a state-of-the-art um, agricultural uh, science program here, a facility here. Tell us about the importance of having that type of, that type of research and, 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 and educational facility here um, for our students. Well, uh, I have to say that we do a lot of applied research. Mm -hmm. We work with the farmers. We help them do a, a lot of things. Excuse me. <coughs> we help them do a lot of things to make sure that they can be successful in their farms. Um, so the, the other option is that it's all University of Missouri in Columbia. Well, if that was the only program, we probably wouldn't have an, an ag program. We wouldn't have an ag program here. And these students would probably go someplace else out of state and probably stay there. We know that there's a demand because of family farms. Um, for students to have an agricultural, most of them are ag business, but some of them are, 
you know, not ag business. Um, so it's very important so that they can go back and run the, the family farm. Uh, they, can, they can be more successful in what they plant and how they plant. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I think our ag program is so successful. Excellent faculty, they, they're doing applied research and they're helping the farmers. And we are actually taking a bachelor's degree south now. Uh, and that's a big, that's a, that was a big step for us, but it was a step that we needed to do. So, so you're stepping down this, this summer. What are, the, uh, what, what, what are your plans once you, uh, once, once you retire from southeast? Well, uh, Janine and I, five years ago, bought a, bought a place in Lake St. Louis, and we knew that that's where we wanted to be, on the little lake and uh, closer to our son and daughter-in-law, who both, by the way, are graduates of southeast, and our two grandsons, Lincoln Kenneth Dobbins and, and Brady Larson Dobbins. Um, but I'm, we're, Janine and I want to do some things when we want to do them, you know, with the schedule of a president, sometimes you, you sacrifice a few of those things to fulfill what you have to do as a president. Um, plus, I, as you know, taught in the new president's academy for ASQ, uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with over 200 presidents, new presidents. So I'm, ASQ has um, a consulting firm that, that uh, consults uh, with all kinds of aspects, and I'm going to do uh, financial management, um, administrative management, and, and um, uh, enrollment management, uh, and also facilities and athletics, so that uh, I can do some consulting, which is quite frankly what I did in the Air Force, um, only at the Air Force level. Uh, so um, there are 20 uh, former presidents. I'm the only one that's ac active. So there, there are 20 of us that uh, have this firm that we uh, work together and and really the purpose is just like the new president's academy is to make sure that they can be successful it's for presidents that may need some assistance um, you know sometimes it's better to get somebody outside to come in that's had some experience before and you know here we've been here 24 years i'm executive vice president and cfo for eight and then president for 16. yeah i, I there, there are a few things that, that we've picked up along the way here that have been successful, so maybe others can use them. We've been talking today with Southeast Missouri State University President Ken Dobbins. Dr. Dobbins, thank you so much for your time and best of luck. Well, actually, it should be best of luck to you, too, because you're, you're leaving us, unfortunately for us, but good for the University of Oklahoma. So we wish you all the best in your new position as news director at the University of Oklahoma's radio station, and we'll miss you. Uh, but keep in touch, okay? Well, thank you very much, and I, and I certainly intend to. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today for Cape Chronicle. The program is a collaboration between the Department of Mass Media at Southeast Missouri State University, the City of Cape Girardeau, and KRCU. Our executive producer is Jim Dufek. I'm Jacob McClellan. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Thank you.